Hello and welcome, it is Designer Dave. Uh, recently I had an interview with Pipkin Pippa. During the course of that interview, there were some questions that came in for me via donation. I've been given the donation money and therefore the responsibility to answer these questions. And I will answer them now. Anonymous asks, the toxic Reddit people shill communist Dave, why you dislike? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> First of all, I don't really consider myself a communist. I don't think that there's any particular ideology that uh, works for everyone. And therefore one person's utopia is another person's dystopia. The best way is to mix ideologies to give everyone some sense of freedom in a world where we don't have much left. <laughs> I, I don't know what toxic Reddit people are showing me, but uh, every, every encounter I've had with Reddit has been uh, pretty terrible, uh, with a few exceptions. Caraface sends $5 and asks, why not IPFS instead of NFTs for game distribution? But the real technology that I want uh, for game distribution is blockchain, which has nothing to do with NFTs or or cryptocurrency in general. It's basically just a way to bypass publishers and distribute games without having to worry about interference or uh, having to appease a corporate master. Ike13D sends $20 and asks, so what part of what NFTs does something that current technology doesn't already do? If it's a question of ownership, then that's something we should be pushing against the terms the corporations force on us. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> that is the part that it deals with in particular. Uh, if it's in your wallet, it's in your wallet. There's nothing that a corporation can do in general to prevent you from having that NFT and selling or trading it. That said, it's not like a guarantee. Like if the game is gone, the corporation shuts it down, then I guess it's gone. And then it's you're reliant on someone else to support any gaming NFTs in that regard. But what it does is it simply allows you to buy, sell, and trade without having to worry about the corporation. So it, it used to be that Steam would allow you to purchase games as gifts and then give them to other people. And therefore you could effectively at least buy and sell stuff. And now that's gone. And now um, you can only purchase games for yourself. It's sort of a way to return to being able to buy, sell, and trade. Now that that's not to that doesn't preclude companies from doing that in some other fashion. The, I think the issue comes from money laundering, which is something that uh, blockchain is rife with. So maybe it is unachievable, and I'm just being overly optimistic. I'm not sure. Rubbish Soldier sends 4.99 and asks, "Can you ask him more about his time working on Stranger's Wrath? What was Lauren Lanning and Oddworld Inhabitants like?" That's a good question. Oddworld Inhabitants was in San Luis Obispo, California, and it was run by my favorite CEO of all time, uh, Sherry McKenna, who had a very holistic view of what the workplace environment should be like. So something that you got when you worked at Oddworld Inhabitants was a gym membership, and um, instead of donuts, they would have things like bagels. Generally, there wasn't too much overtime. It was frowned upon. That isn't to say it didn't happen. It's just that it was frowned upon. And generally, most people went home after a normal nine-hour day. <clears throat> Oddworld was one of my favorite places to work. Lauren Lanning was a little bit strange, <laughs> but he definitely gave good feedback on games. But he didn't have a good game design sense. We got that from Eric Yo, and that's why I think that Stranger's Wrath is one of the standouts of the Oddworld series. It was a really cool company to work at, and then EA basically screwed them by not doing marketing correctly for Stranger's Wrath, a game that by all accounts should have been maybe one of the best selling games on Xbox for that era, but wasn't. And I blame EA for that. Screw EA. Utopiatix sends 355 and asks, why does the video game seem to emphasize employing people permanently rather than shorter term projects linked to contracts like the film industry? So that's a very good question. The answer to that is, I don't know, but basically because the game industry pays people so little, and in terms of what they get in return for uh, a game that goes like a blockbuster hit, the employees make almost nothing. Maybe there's some sort of bonus program, but it's like a fraction of a percentage of what they actually get from any huge title. I think the, the point is to keep those people in those sort of slave wages <laughs> for as long as possible, so that you're not constantly having to hire up a team again every time a, a, you wanna do a new project. A lot of games also require a lot of maintenance. 
there's some argument that maybe expansions and games as a service came from having to justify having all those people between projects. But I will tell you that as soon as a game launches, there's a massive layoffs anyways. Your job's not secure. And while I agree with the idea of like everyone coming together and making a massive game and then shipping it out there and then dispersing and like doing something else, the idea is that uh, I would form a company that basically hires a bunch of people for a project and with the knowledge that when the project ends, they all get a revenue stream from sales, but we disperse and they can all go their separate ways and do whatever else they want or come up with a new project to work on. I think that's a good model for, for most games, but because games as a service is so popular and you have to maintain these games and if there's a crash bug, you have to fix it. There's all sorts of reasons to want to keep people around, even when it would be more beneficial both to them and to you to sort of go your separate ways. As soon as it becomes a corporate thing, it's hard to not want to keep those people around. But I, I agree that that's a more interesting and I think better model for games is to come together and make the game and then ship it in a very good state and then leave it. Woodcheck00 sent a $5 super chat and asks, how is video game consulting not a scam, Dave? Uh, it's not a scam because I provide actual insights and my years of experience to improving someone's game. Recently, I've been doing this a lot. If they felt they weren't getting their value out of me, then they certainly wouldn't be continually purchasing my services again. When you're a new game studio and everyone on your team has less than five years of experience, someone who has 24 years of experience at a multi of studios is going to be able to point out a lot of things to avoid and a lot of you know pitfalls of game development that might set them back months or even years. Helping them avoid big mistakes is the most appreciated thing that I am hired for. It's not a scam because it's worth the money. <laughs> Alex Blackfoot sends five dollars and asks, of the various Vidja projects out there, is there any one project that you jump at the opportunity to contribute to? I'm going to assume you mean video game. Generally, I like to contribute to uh, anything that sort of appeals to me. Like if there's like a high fantasy setting or a post-apocalyptic setting, I like to contribute to those in, in some fashion. I look for little writing opportunities and things like that. I, I enjoy doing those sorts of things because then it's a very direct one-to-one. -one, like I write this, it goes into the game and it appears in the game and I get to see it. It's fun. I did want to work on a Dune game. I missed out on both those opportunities. Azath Oath sent a $1 and one cent super chat. What games am I working on currently? So right now it's a lot of NFT stuff and a psychology thing for the Air Force. Nothing particularly interesting or anything that I particularly want to share at this moment. If you are interested in NFT gaming projects, uh, you can follow my Twitter version of myself, Dave in the Metaverse, and you can sort of see what I talk about there. And if you go to my YouTube channel, you'll see that I'm actually doing creation videos for some of them. In the case of Soulcraft, my ro most recent one, you can see me creating a world map for them. I'm not really shilling the NFTs, but I am showing off the game development side of these things. And, and if that's interesting to you, check it out. BC sent $3.91. Condom money for Dave. For real, thanks though for coming on and dealing with everyone's pipkin. <laughs> Are you saying I have too many kids? <clears throat> don't don't need the condoms. The wife got the snip. It was a fun chat experience, and uh, I would certainly come on again. So don't worry, I wasn't scared off. Kiernoth sends one dollar and asks. Explain to me why Luna tanked and died. Yeah, give me the easy ones, sure. So Luna was a cryptocurrency associated with a stable coin called US Terra. The point of UST was to be linked to the dollar, and so it would always it was always supposed to stay at one dollar in value. But it was an algorithmic stable coin. And what that means is that if certain parameters were taking it too low, it would do something automatically to fix it. And in this case, what it would do is, is it would create Luna, which was an attached coin, and try to raise the value that way. And ultimately what ended up happening was it made trillions and trillions of Luna and devalued the Luna to almost nothing and thus ended up devaluing itself because they had it attached to Bitcoin that they then traded to someone or something along those lines, which triggered the whole thing going out of control and collapsing. Stable coins in and of themselves are not necessarily a bad idea. The problem with an algorithmically supported stable coin is that someone can figure out a way to abuse that. And that's what happened to UST and Luna. That's why you do have to be very careful if you don't understand cryptocurrencies. I personally did not invest in Luna. When I heard algorithmically <laughs> supported stablecoin, I was like, 
uh-oh, <laughs> any sort of algorithm will be exploited. So I'm not going to say that I predicted it, but I was right to be concerned. If none of that made sense to you, stay away from crypto. Just don't go anywhere near it because because you will get burned at some point. Kiernoth sends another dollar and says, Co corporate necrosis is a thought terminating cliche, Dave. You're doing the same thing. No, that's not true. Corporate necrosis is not uh, thought terminating. It's actually intended to make you think more about what's going on when these corporations become zombie monsters and destroy everything in their path. It's just a term that I think is very fitting of what happens as companies turn into corporations and, and what happens to what otherwise were good ideas back in the day that become sort of a legacy that destroys the company in the future when they get too big and it doesn't make sense anymore. It is what it is implies that there's nothing you can do about it, so there's no point thinking about it. That's, that is a thought terminating cliche. And that's it. So it was really fun chatting with uh, Pipkin Pippa. And I hope to do it again in the future. And uh, if you guys come to my channel for game design, uh, very happy to have you here. And you can always join my Discord and ask me more questions there. I pretty much answer everything at some point, though I am sitting on a bunch of questions right now that I've promised to get to, and I, I will get to them. But I wanted to get these out of the way and uh, say if you're uh, interested in uh, VTubers uh, <laughs> and you're from my community, check out Pippa and see what you think about her stream. Otherwise, have a good day.